All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to week four of ABCD Reprim. We are delighted to be with you again in a totally normal, not atypical at all, a week in which everything is going just fine for all of our US students and uh, nothing of impact is happening for uh, our international students. Um, and so in a also not completely unrelated uh, uh, instance, please make sure everyone is kind of focusing on self care this week and uh, taking a moment to reflect on things this week and make sure you're not, you know, putting too much pressure on yourself. With that in mind, we do want to say that um, we're a little bit behind on our quizzes this week and we will make sure those get pushed out to you on Monday. And uh, Jessica's going to be telling us a little bit more about that later. But I'm going to go ahead and get us started. And we want to welcome this week, we've got Damien Fair, who's going to be telling us about uh, ABCD imaging measures and uh, our own JB Pauline, who is going to be talking to us from the Reprenum perspective about pre-registration and hacking. So uh, let's give Damien a moment to introduce himself. Hi, Damien. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, I am Damien Fair. I am a professor in the Institute of Child Development and the Pediatrics Department at the University of Minnesota. I'm also the new uh, director of the Masonic Institute of the Developing Brain, which uh, is just started and we're going to be moving into our new building at around this time next year, hopefully after a pandemic. <laughs> uh, I My background is that I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I study brain development from infancy through childhood, adolescence, and into young adulthood. Um, I'm probably most widely known for my work with resting state connectivity, but we do Lots of work with lots of different types of um, other types of measurements. I am a PI on the on the OHS, or actually the OHSU site of ABCD, and I still so I still th keep close ties there. Even I've moved since we started the original grant. I'm also a co-investigator in the data core of the of the DAIRC, and that is that is home down in U at UCSD under the under the under Anders Dale. So I think that's my, that's the gist. And I can answer any more questions as we move along. Awesome. Thank you so much, Damien. And JB, do you want to say a quick hi? You've been introduced before, but. Oh, you're on mute. Unmute. You really want to hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm JB Pauline. I work at uh, McGill University in Montreal. Um, also, I still hold, I think, uh, an appointment at uh, Berkeley. Uh, and my work is more on the uh, neuroimaging methods and the statistical aspects, and uh, working with uh, David Kennedy on the reporting uh, project, and the uh, where I chair the uh, training core of the reporting project. So, uh, uh, a lot of uh, action on this side. I also am dipping role in the INCF, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, which uh, is trying to make neuroscience more fair, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the acronym. And, um, and uh, yeah, uh, and that, that's me. And I'd be happy to answer any question you have, if I can. Excellent. Okay, so again, today we're going to talk about ABCD imaging measures and repronym pre-registration and p-hacking, but a reminder to everybody, we're going to immediately flow from our normal 60-minute conversation into an extra 30-minute bonus conversation where we're going to be welcoming um, our colleagues at the NIMH Data Archive who are responsible for archiving ABCD data. They're going to be able to answer additional questions related to um, our ducts and data access. So. In thinking about the plans for project week, we've kind of covered that we, we, we want to ensure that everyone who participates in project week has access to ABCD data and has got successfully gone through the process with at ENDA. And so in, in order for us to make some better plans, we want to get a better sense of how many folks have uh, gotten their access already and have completed that homework assignment in Canvas, which I am able to see. Um, but also who's still in the process of getting that access or who is perhaps stuck along the way or who is not eligible to gain access and thus will not be participating. 
Long story short, uh, we would like enrolled students to complete a new um, survey in Canvas. It's called the ABCD Data Access slash Duck Status Survey, and it should be listed under your assignments. Um, we would like you to go ahead and complete that just so that we can have a better sense of how many students ultimately plan to be able to participate in Project Week. Um, there's also the ABCD Data Access Confirmation. We've had uh, about a third of you complete that so far. Once you gain access to ABCD data, please go ahead and complete that survey as well. And a, a fairly gentle reminder that, you know, there was a lot of interest in this course and, and we had to limit the number of enrolled students, um, you know, based on the resources that are available to us. So we really want to make sure that um, those students who are enrolled are able to participate in Project Week so that we can perhaps consider, um, uh, you know, giving up slots to uh, other students who um, aren't able to get access to the, to the data. Um, and as well, please also remember to kind of follow along with those weekly quizzes that mark your progress so that you can stay roughly in line with the progress that we're making um, and not get too, too far behind. So with that, those are sort of my general announcements and I will hand it over to Dave for his. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this week and uh, thank you to our lecturers, Damien and JB for their lovely lectures. And I'm looking forward to some exciting conversations about those, uh, those features. Uh, I guess I don't want to steal any of uh, Jessica's announcements, but you will be, uh, the enrolled students will be getting information about the Jupyter Hub access if they haven't already. So that's actually going to be deployed shortly. So that's exciting. It's a common platform and it also lets us work on some cloud-based uh, access to data in a way that's a little bit more you know, friendly, or cloud friendly to, to that data access and also gives us a common you know, platform. So I don't really have any other introductory things. I will turn things over to Jessica. Awesome, thank you so much, Dave. Um, so yeah, just uh, wanted to quickly announce for the enrolled students, we did send, send out an email announcing the rollout of the Jupyter Hub, which is um, a online uh, cloud-based computational platform where we can kind of uh, help control the uh, environment settings that you guys will be doing computations with for project week. And also you can use that for your um, data exercises moving forward too. Um, so please do try and access that. Um, there is also a, a, an extra kind of quiz that we put up on Canvas, um, which walks you through how to access that and kind of walks you through a Jupyter notebook that is up there on the hub right now. Um, so please do give that um, a try. And if there are any issues that come up, will be available in the Slack or, um, yeah, it's probably the best way to ping us. Uh, you can also send us an email at info at abcd-repronym.org. Um, the other announcement that I wanted to make in terms of just general course stuff is enroll students, do please start thinking about what project ideas you might want to propose or work on for the project week. I do see some chatter happening in the Slack in the project discussions channel, which is awesome, keep doing that. Um, because we're going to, in the next week or so, give you some more information about where you can submit your project proposals, um, which will uh, kind of carry on to the session two of the course while we kind of generate that a little bit more. So start thinking about what kind of projects you might want to work on for project week in the meantime, and look out for an announcement about where you can submit your project proposals soon. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to announce uh, was that uh, week, five, week five quizzes, uh, as Angie mentioned, are going to be available on Monday instead of today, um, just to give everyone a few extra days to catch up on stuff that, during what has been a challenging week for many people. Um, so uh, as usual, quizzes uh, are going to be available uh, on Canvas for enrolled students and then on the course materials website for observer students via a Google form. Uh, and before we turn it over to questions from JB and Damien, uh, I just wanna quickly give Christina Rapuano a, a chance to introduce herself. She's one of the TAs for the class. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm a postdoc at Yale University with BJ Casey. So I'm at one of the ABCD sites. Uh, which is really exciting and has given me, um, uh, uh, I think, a lot of perspective on what goes into all of this. So, um, yes, I'm happy to be 
kind of hosting the um, Q&A session here. Um, so we can go ahead and get started, I think, unless there's anything else. Okay. So we have um, a lot of questions related to the imaging measures um, and how, how best to analyze those. So um, Damien, I'm gonna throw you the first question. Um, so we actually had several questions related to um, how or when to download and analyze the um, tabulated data versus like the raw data or minimally pre-processed data. So, um, so I guess I'm gonna just try to summarize these. So, so when is best to download one versus um, the other? And then related to analyses, um, we had a couple of questions about how to go about doing that specifically in the case of minimally pre-processed resting state data, um, what steps are still left to be done there? Um, Got it. Yeah. So um, I'd say the choice of what to download and what to utilize for analyses will, will likely um, be very dependent on what type of question you're trying to answer and what you're, you know, what, you know, what are you trying to figure out? The tabulated data were, were generated in, in part for ease of use, you know, that were kind of linked up with all of the behavioral, all the other measurements that are non, non imaging. And, but there's a lot of decisions, as you can imagine, that have to go into generating a tabulated list. What, what is, what are the measures you're going to use? What is the region set you want to use for, let's say for cortical thickness or, you know, or functional connectivity, which is in essence, infinite. So the number of measures that you can pull, you know, pull from it. So um, if, if the, and they were just made for a small kind of best guess for some things. So if, if you're the types of question you're, you can answer are conducive to that, you know, to utilizing those, then you, sh you should, you should definitely just utilize the tabulated data. If not, then you might want to use some of the other resources that are available that provide a little bit more flexibility at very different stages of the processing. So the minimally processed data are, are very useful in many ways, particularly for folks who kind of have their own ideas about how they want to do denoising or pre-processing of their own data. Um, there are a few th there are a few characteristics of the data set that um, can make it very may make it a little bit difficult to just take it to use you know to process the data purely from the raw data, um, and those relate to the what we call the bias field corrections and some of the distortion corrections and that are kind of relatively intensive um, and can be unique based on the different vendors and the style the data was collected. And so the minimum process was, was kind of to get you past some of those bottlenecks so you could do more standard stuff. Um, the difficulty, the, the hard part, of course, even with that is that you're still dealing with, you know, 10,000 sub, you know, 10,000, 11,000 subjects where for most laboratories and a lot of investigators being able to handle all that data, even if it's already kind of started along the way, can still be quite difficult. So it's for that reason where there's a third, you know, option, which is to download the data that's kind of, kind of gone nuts to bolts, you know, from beginning to end with um, some, some data that people can just start with if they, if they feel like however, how the processing was done is, is you know, good enough to up, to up to their standards and, and things of that nature. So again, it depends a lot on what you're what you're trying to do, but and and your com and how comfortable you are with hand handling the data from different different stages. So and then one question related to that. So if one were to download the minimally pre-processed data and then use a um, a default processing pipeline, so we have a student using the con toolbox um, with the default uh, settings. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, downsides to accidentally running through a step that was already completed, or would oh. um, would that kind of detect it and skip it or distort the data? That is a very good question. Um, that also depends on what you're trying to do with it, but there are some there are some concerns of repeating things that have already been done um, because a lot of the a lot of the the priors or the assumptions about what the how the data is organized can maybe be problematic. Not always, you know. And and the the other piece is that you always and we always try to reduce the number of times the data are in essence resampled, you know, so that you're not smoothing out the data and, and kind of including characteristics of the data that are are purely a result of you kind of 
messing with it a, a bunch. So there are a few concerns about that. I don't know it, it's gonna, how the magnitude of those, you know, those items will likely depend largely on, again, like what, you know, what the question is and what your, what the specifics are. But I, I would be a little bit concerned of repeating stuff, but you know, it's hard to know what the magnitude of that, you know, th those effects would be at least, at least from my perspective. Okay, great. Um, and oh, then switching one, other, one thing on that, things like distortion correction, sorry, I just want to make sure if you're trying to repeat something like that and like using the original images or thing, that would cause some major problems, you know? So if you're, depends on what you're repeating, you know, so if you're repeating distortion correction on top, something that's already been corrected, then you could cause some, some major, major quality ish control problems. Right. All right. And then um, switching to the, uh, the task-based data, uh, so the Paul Drack group recently criticized the stop signal task uh, in terms of the design and its usefulness. Can you comment on that? Um, I would say that there's, there are now, um, you know, well, one is that there's a paper, there's, an, there's a, a response to that original paper now that's provided by ABCD and led by Hugh Garavan and his, and his group. Um, who who was you know part of the impetus of the of putting together this task? There is there are certainly some issues you know with the with the task design. Um, whether it's useless or not, I think would be I think a lot of people would quibble with. You know, I don't I don't I don't think many folks would agree with that in the magnitude of this. Some of the some of the effects that were originally described may, may not may not be quite as bad as you know as it was originally reported. I think in fact that. Bissette, who I believe was the um, who was the first author on that paper. I think they 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 revised you know their that initial publication after um, after this initial response and that's some discussions between that group and ABCD. Um, now there is a like I said there is a this is not my you know this is not my Belwick. I'm not a you know uh, this is I'm not a CPT you know guy per se. So but I. So I would say that there's lots of differences in opinions on that front, and I I, I would encourage everybody to read um, both kind of publications with an open mind and and utilize that to make some informed decisions. All right, um, and then um, we'll maybe stick a little bit more with the um, task-based data, and then we can switch over to the referendum side. But um, are all of the three fMRI tasks going to stay stay the same throughout the study? And if so, are you worried about uh, practice effects influencing performance and the bold response? So, for example, participants are probably going to recognize the face and place stimuli of the NBAC task in future sessions. Yeah. That's a very good. That's a that's a. I, I saw that question right 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 out right, 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 getting getting on. That's a very good question. They will stay the same throughout the throughout the study. You know the again like the magnitude of the what the kind of practice effects will be when someone's being scanned. You know a couple of years apart. You know um, through us, it's, it's not super clear. In fact, Christi, uh, Christina, you probably would be able to answer this question better than me. Um, um, in part because BJ was you know, was the was one of the folks who helped us design this. But I think that we, we had to make some decisions about being able to look at longitudinal trajectories, which was the main point of this, of this study and um, theoretical issues like the one that's just described. And I think in the end, we decided that the, you know, the main goal probably over, superseded the, this potential issue, which is certainly valid, but the, again, it's more about the magnitude and that part is not, is not super clear. Yeah, and uh, so just related to that, so um, we are, uh, BJ's group, we're um, currently working on um, a, a data set in adults where we're scanning the same exact paradigm to look at these practice effects. Um, of course, not on the same scale of two years in between, but I think that will maybe help speak to that question, um, and we hope to release those data soon. Um, yeah. okay. I think the two years in between is the really important variable. Yeah. That's a long period of time, especially for kids this age. And yeah. so the, the, the idea that they would remember specific stimuli, I think is not really um, very realistic. Um, the other thing is, you know, we are seeing that they kind of understand, they kind of remember the general processes. So like our mock sessions are much shorter than they were the first time, but um, remembering specific stimuli and having practice effects due to that. I, I just find that to be not so yeah. much of a concern, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page. I, I agree. 
I, 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 I don't dismiss the concern because I don't have any pure data to show us there is no effect, but just, you know, if I were to bet, you know, I would say it's probably quite small. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll give Damien a bit of a break here and hop over to a reprenum question. Um, so for JB, um, I have not pre-registered a study before. What is the minimum and or typical amount of detail people will pre-register? So, um, I mean, I'll give you my a bit more like uh, experience and opinion. I, I don't think there is a typical manner. Uh, so I guess it would depend first, are you pre-registering pre for a journal? Or are you just pre-registering, I would say for yourself a little bit. So that's maybe the first kind of like a uh, switch. Uh, so if you're pre-registering for a journal, they would have a specific uh, guidance on how, you know, and what you should do. Uh, so like uh, Chris Chambers in uh, Cortex or like, you know, they, they, you know, and then, then have a look at that. And that also will help you if you want to register for yourself, what kind of things you should probably do uh, as well. Uh, in, in, a, in essence, what you want to do is uh, state uh, as clearly and as detailed as possible the hypothesis that you are uh, having. And and how you're going to test for those hypotheses? What uh, and and you know in, and if you're doing that as much as you can, and, and sometimes it's not easy because there are kind of those, uh, uh, options on, on the way. You may have like to go from you know a, if that happens, if I find that sort of result, I will have to go to take root A. If I take if I find this other type of result, I will take root B. Uh, so so lay lay out all those. You know things as well. Uh, you know it is uh, as much as we can, and 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 of of course it's not going to be entirely comprehensive and entirely sort of like you know uh, uh, mapped uh, for every. I mean most of the times it's it's not going to be mapped entirely. Uh, however, uh, that mental exercise of mapping as much as you can uh, and 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 laying out exactly what you're going to test and how you're going to test uh, is an excellent exercise in any case. Uh, so even if you're not registering for a journal, even if it's for yourself, it's really like an, a, such a good exercise of thinking, thinking ahead of what kind of analysis and how you're going to lay out those plans. And uh, of course, having the additional benefit of trying to limit the, uh, the p-hacking aspect. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, let me know if you, uh, yeah, if you want more information on that, but that's, that, that'd be my first answer. Great. And Satya has posted a link in the chat um, that may serve as a, a guide from the OSF. And I'll also note that on the Slack channel, this was brought up and Dustin posted an example, one of our TAs posted an example of, of a pre-registration. Um, so we would encourage everyone to kind of share examples as they find them because I think this is one way that you can really get a sense for how useful pre-registration is and, and you know what it should include is by looking at some specific examples that are out there either on the OSF or on various repositories online. Yeah, I think that's a good point too. And I think in that question that was brought up uh, for specific examples, um, I thought it might be great to post it to UJB or, or Damien too. Um, do you guys know of any examples for pre-registration for the ABCD study that um, students could look at and, and get examples that's, from? That's a very that's a very good question. But you know there have been a, several the DCN, which is a which a lot of people know developmental cognitive neuroscience. They they do pre They've now do pre-registration, and they've they've been been accepting. We've been utilizing them as an ABCD, you know, location for publications for quite a while. And with Flux, which is the development of cognitive neuroscience, another um, society. So those are a couple of them that I I know off the bat. But I do know that that I, I'm going to look this up while we're talking. That there are some additional outlets that are coming online that are I think being led by Wes Thompson and a few others that I need to I need to I need to dig in to figure out you know what ex what specific medium that was from David maybe you know do you know that I'm not sure I know that specific medium but I do know there was a good bit of effort in the deep to try to both encourage uh, pre-registration and also to really try to funnel 
you know, sort of exploratory things and and uh, uh, sort of execution of the planned experimental types of things. So again, I know they were pushing that. I don't know exactly how far they've gotten. And if there's additional outlets, that's a great West question. So hopefully he'll respond yeah. to that. So I may blurt out a, additional answers to that at some point in the, as soon as I get some more info in the background here <laughs> for everybody. And we our uh, question and answer documents are living documents, so we can always add content to them going forward if you don't learn it during this this hour. The other just nuance I wanted to add is there is not much you know pre-registered yet out there. And again, every time we get asked, it's mostly an education type of thing. People need to learn about it. People need to get used to it. Uh, so any of these, you know, our opportunity to help you learn about it and help people do it is really critical to get that be more commonly accepted or commonly used. And the maybe the just additional thing is uh, it's mostly like a, the, the, the initial impetus of the pre-registration was to uh, make sure that you don't do too much p-hacking. So for instance, for DCM, it's a, it's a great tool because uh, it's such so easy to think of a, a specific uh, graph uh, and test a specific graph and, and think, oh, uh, that doesn't give me the results that I expected. Uh, let me add that region. Let me remove that region and, you know, in the graph and, and, and let me add that uh, edge. And, you know, and that, that's extremely easy. So like, you know, to justify that post hoc, uh, you know, uh, having look at the results. And I think that's registration is trying really to avoid that. However, it doesn't prevent you at all for exploring things. It's just uh, making sure that you know what you're going to explore and what you're going to test. And I think that's that's really uh, the, the, the gist of it. And, and even describing how you're going to explore is, is such an interesting uh, mental exercise. Uh, it's really, really for yourself. I think you have to do it for yourself first. Uh, and then, of course, for like, you know, more like a, the rigor, uh, for yourself in terms of planning, if you want, uh, in, in terms of like uh, sharpening your questions and, and methods. Uh, uh, and, all, and obviously, you know, if you want to, you know, uh, try to make sure that you're not uh, inferring things that are, are possibly, uh, you know, uh, uh, not, should not be inferred uh, with the, um, the, the p-value problems. Well, just, I'll just say, just like to add one thing is that, is that we do have to be careful. It's like, um, that you that it's it's an awesome tool and that it's easy to make it feel like you're safe, but it, you can somehow sometimes easily fall into the same exact problems that are that it's meant to overcome. I'll just give you one example. I mean, we do this all the time in in our space when we do neuroimaging. Is we like I, my hypothesis is well, the effect of choice will be in the prefrontal cortex, right? So uh, you know the prefrontal cortex is like a, over a third of the brain, you know. So it's not, it's so unspecific that it's easy to, you can do the same type of p hacking to get to the prefrontal cortex. And it looks like, oh, my hypothesis is right. So it's, it, so it's, it's very easy to kind of, um, um, unless you really think about why you're doing the pre-registration to kind of fall into the same trap that we're trying to avoid. So I just would like to, I would just emphasize that we, that you, we, that's the most important thing is you, is you clearly understand why you're doing the pre-registration um, so that you, you treat it properly, you know. Yeah, there's uh, absolutely uh, then in fair. Thanks for thanks for the uh, the addition. Um, one thing that uh, you should think of is really uh, what is a useful hypothesis. Like uh, you know, if if it's in the prefrontal cortex, uh, as you said, it's 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 a very 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 large. Uh, you could you could ask you could say, hey, my hypothesis is that it is in the brain. And, you know, and, and you're pretty sure like that this is going to be uh, to be true. So, so the, the more focused, the more precise, uh, the more uh, quantitative your hypotheses are, uh, the more uh, the re you know the rejection of the null of those things is is uh, is powerful, is is is, uh, is impactful. Uh, and that's a, that's a very general concept. Uh, that uh, if you haven't uh, read that book, I would really recommend it's the uh, the certain one from uh, you know like a. Psychology as a science. I think it uh, has a very good uh, chapter on this. Uh, on on this, you know, I mean, going back to you know, <laughs> uh, epistemology uh, aspect. You know, what what is what is a good hypothesis, uh, and and uh, and how do you test it properly? Is a is a whole like a, a general concept to to grasp. I think, but um, but yeah. So so you have really have to be precise in in the description of what you want to do because there's a lot of flexibility in each of those steps. And we know that there is a lot of flexibility in uh, each of the steps that we are going. So, so the more precise the, the, you know, the, uh, 
uh, the, the better. And you know, and and if you can, if you if you if you really have the uh, the, uh, the ends, and with ABCD you you really have sometimes the um, the, the number. Um, you can always you know explore in in thirty percent, forty percent of the population, and then test of or seventy percent, and then test on the on on the rest, and then and then you you really are like a you know saving yourself uh, uh, from from a lot of uh, trouble in in this instance. So so yes, uh, it's not your tests are not going to be as powerful, but what you gain in the exploration side, you may you may you know like a, uh, may not be entirely. You know, like uh, the, the ends may be sufficient uh, for you to to be powerful uh, uh, in that in that respect. So so that's another approach that uh, I would put in the uh, in the description of your uh, uh, pre-registration as well. Okay, great. Um, so maybe switching back over to ABCD um, imaging measures. So we have a couple of questions about the uh, pre-processing. So. Damien, during your lecture about neuroimaging measures, the large effect of motion was discussed. Um, it showed, for example, an effect of race on motion. So first, how does that influence the represent representability of the sample and generalizability of the results? Um, and where might we find details of those effects and, if, and, and how to correct for those effects? Yeah, those are, this, is, this is a good one. This is a very good question. I don't, I don't think it speaks much to the the fact that the fact that there's lo there's lots of measures, including race, but several other things that are related to tightly related to motion. I don't think that I don't think that um, I don't think that specifically tells us much about how representative the sample is per se. But it does tell you that, it, in in particular, because of how when you're dealing with neuroimaging how tightly motion is linked to artifacts and systematic artifacts and false findings and noise, things like that. You have to be absolutely super careful that you're handling these issues, you're handling you know, motion properly in your data. Otherwise, it's very easy to get fooled. Um, and in fact, you know, I, you know the, bringing up race is, a, is probably a good one because that's because it's it raises the, as a construct, even though there's papers being that's written written about it, are likely unlikely to be something that you can find in the brain. But it could look like that because of some secondary effect that's related to motion. You know, when maybe who knows? Like I'm just I'm gonna I'm just making this up. But that race is you know is in part related to poverty, right? And then poverty is tightly related to motion. So it looks like you have these you know. So you got to be really, really careful. I think that was the main point of that slide. Now, the the data for the motion, you know, to be able to look yourself at how motion relates to any given measure in the data set is available both in the tabulated data um, and in the and in the and the pre-processed data sets that we that we talked about earlier, the fully pre-processed data sets that we talked about earlier. So the the more specifics, like the the results, kind of the things that I presented there, are being are being worked on for a paper right now that we publish soon, just to people give a give people a the context about how how tightly motion is related to all different types, including sight, you know, which was it's a huge factor. So it, it's it's critical, right, that this is being you know cared for correctly, particularly for a sample this large, because it's easy to see significant small effects. Okay, um, so maybe just going back to the pre-registration question for a minute. Um, so when pre-registering a study or creating a pre-registered uh, registered report, is there a turnaround time that will delay when you can actually run uh, analyses and what is that timeline like? That's a good point. Uh, and you know, and that's, you know, between the time when you write your registration and your analysis, and you're actually doing the analysis, uh, there might be a new method, there might be uh, something like uh, updates on you know, what uh, new variables or what, you know, something. So, uh, so I would say uh, that I don't think there is you know, a time, a guideline. I would say, you know, this is, this is something you want to stamp and say, hey, at that stage, these these are my plan, and you know, and and try to get on with it. You know, as 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 soon as when you're ready to you know get going, this is when you do the uh, the pre registration. Um, 
And then if there are revised version of that because of the timeline and the, the changes, you know, uh, then you just register those as well. Uh, so that, you know, there's a transparency of, of how the uh, research process is going on. And, and, and you can go back to it and, and you know, possibly discover uh, sort of like a, a uh, you know, like uh, issues, or like, uh, or at least be be sure that exactly what you've done uh, is is what you've you've you've, you've planned. And like, I think that's, that, I don't think there's a, you know, a, you know like a, a specific timeline that we can we can we can uh, give. Uh, it, it also so much depends on you know how long those uh, those those analyses are going to take. All right, um, and then. So with regard to the ABCD. Uh, processing. Um, we have a question for Damien. What is your opinion on controversial pre-processing steps such as global signal regression, uh, which seems to be associated with both noise and biological signal? Um, there's also some people arguing that high frequencies that are typically eliminated by low pass filters have signals of interest for functional connectivity. What's your take on that? Well, A, I don't think whole brain regression is that controversial if you look at the data. <laughs> So, but I will say that there, you're right that there there is this um, there is an issue with regard to true whole brain signal and the noise that you get in the the noise that it corrects and that is that is certainly a real thing. I, I don't mean to be completely dismissive of that. What I would say is that in the way that we collect data, the the, the style that we are able to collect data with humans, where you can't you can't maximize the SNR, the, the contribution of the true whole brain signal to that, to the signal that you see in humans, it turns out to be relatively very small. We've done a bunch of tests on this in monkeys and in other, other species where you can do, you can control the conditions very, very tightly. Uh, I'll say a little bit about that. But I think the most important about the, the measurement that, that, that it's just not a whole lot of argument for is that it is amazingly effective at getting rid of motion artifact. You know, and that's one of the things we just talked about as being critical to be able to control. Um, and it's not perfect, but not doing it almost guarantees that you get artifacts in your data. I mean, and you can look at it. You know, there's now there's been lots of other methods to try to combat this that are that, that are that seem to be very good for getting for getting motion related data that has like ICA and things like that that are really good at getting motion related artifacts that have spatial that have spatial content to them right so like if i have an artifact that has that doesn't necessarily go across the whole brain but it actually has a spatial characteristic to it those are those techniques are really good at getting those types of artifacts but they're blind to things that happen across the whole brain they just are you can't they can't see it which means they're still in there Right, and so you need to, no matter what, you still need you need to figure out a way to pull it out. And so far, there's there there hasn't been any kind of benchmark methods that do as well as whole brain regression. Although it doesn't mean there won't be. We just we need people like on the call to help us figure that out, so we can kind of get better, you know, even better ways to kind of deal with it. But right now, we haven't seen a whole lot that's we haven't seen out there a whole lot that's that's better. So I I don't I think what's more controversial is if you don't get rid of the motion artifacts. <laughs> and that's what that's what scares me the most about, you know, spurious findings and things like that in literature. So um, so I, I come from one camp on this, obviously, but I, you know, there's there's lots of papers that are that it's harder that are harder to refute on this topic, at least out there right now. And just to complicate that question a little bit more, or maybe extend it, I should say, we have a couple of questions related to um, other types of corrections. So for functional connectivity measures, were there any variables that were included beyond those to correct for motion and field distortion? And then I'm going to also attach another one on here about uh, respiratory corrections, if you want to speak to that. A little about what? Oh, respiratory, respiratory correction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's the, so the distortion correction is, is, is applied there, you know, um, to you know, to correct for distortions, that's for that would have best both for the rest and the task. And then you said another one. Any other? There's you know, those other other aspects of like actually yeah. regressing on motion yeah. and you know, um, you did you did mention the the high frequency stuff. I I I'm a little bit agnostic on this right now, in part because I just don't quite understand it, or like I haven't been able to dig in to understand what the effect of just leaving all this stuff in that that also relates to other types of artifacts you see in bold. You know, you know, heart rate variability, respirations. I I just I'm like I I 
I just haven't been, I, I haven't, I, have, I don't know enough yet to be able to really answer that particular question. Um, with regard to the respiratory artifact, that's another great question. The, it's, this one's fascinating. It's, so it, it, these are corrected for what we call these B0 artifacts in bold. So if people are not familiar with this, and I can't remember if I talked about, I don't think I did in the lecture. Um, we've known this for years, and there's been all types of techniques that are uh, kind of put into the actually how we ac acquire the data itself to correct for these types of artifacts. But what they are is essentially, you know, when you're, you know, when you're breathing, right? You're breathing that change that actually changes the field, right? It's almost like if I'm taking a picture and I, you know, kind of move the camera, right? It may look like your it may look like your head is moving simply just because you move the field and not necessarily because the head actually moved. Okay. And that is problematic if you think about we're using, we're actually using the, the our known relationship of motion and the bolt signal to regress out, you know, motion related artifact. But if the regressor, if the correspondence of the signal and what appears to be motion, we call it pseudo motion or fictitious motion, is wrong. Those regressors will be wrong. You'll be, you'll be removing for in, if you're doing scrubbing, for example, or spike regression or anything like that. You'll be you'll be removing or changing frames that where there's no actual bold artifact. So so we published a paper a year, it's the year or two ago now, um, where kind of really characterized that. Now it's much easier to see this artifact because the the, the pace at which we're collecting each TR is much faster than before. And so it better corresponds, it's able to see the, the respiratory artifacts that exist relative to your chest motion much more easy. It's not split across multiple frequency domains. In any case, there, so in the, in the processing, there are, there, we, we have um, characterized the ABCD data in kind of the best estimates of the, where that kind of artifact may, may land inside your motion, motion estimates. And then we, 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 we remove those from the motion estimates to assist with uh, any regressions and, and um, um, scrubbing or anything, anything like that. Okay, great. Um, all right, so here's a question for uh, both, both of you, JB and, and Damien. Um, I understand the importance of running power analyses before running your analysis, but I'm not sure how I would do that with the ABCD study. Specifically, my understanding is that power analyses should be run on pilot data. Has ABCD yeah. released pilot data for this purpose? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think the ABCD is it, what it what it is doing is it's giving and giving us a, a good estimate of what we should not, you know what we should be expecting. There's not really pilot data that's it, well. Let me just say this: there's not really pilot data that um, that exists per se with regard to the ABCD data that you can use to generate to you know use existing data to to do a power analysis. But what I will say, and this was mentioned very briefly in the lecture, is that we have developed some. Um, you know, match data sets across 20 different, 27 different measures that essentially match into three bins. One is kind of like a, you know, half, you know, close to half of the data set, you know, that's um, for like a test, you know, data set, or and then the second one that's like a, a train or another test data set. And the third data set, which is about 300 subjects, which may, you may, which has the exact same characteristics that may be used for something like that. Um, I haven't really thought about that too much, in part because the, the data set's so large that it's right now how we're using it is using it to get a good, good, a good, a good estimate in general of what our effect sizes should be and what we should, what what we should be shooting at for our power analyses. But um, I suppose that that those data splits could help with that endeavor for sure. Why don't we use this to ping into the next? Um, related question just to see how similar the uh, answers are. Just curious, but for the collection, um, 3165 matched participant groups, what was the rationale for the third much smaller group of 300 subjects instead of just keeping it to two groups? That was, that, that was, it was for stuff like this. <laughs> I anticipated the question, that's why we did that. No, it, we, <laughs> we actually, um, we, we, we did that for really kind of having a completely independent data set for like playing around, generating templates, things like that, that you want, you might want to have independent from two large groups. Um, so 
that that was the rationale. And we, we imagined that there would be all different types of ways as, as that stuff gets out in the community that we could never even think of, that people might want a third independent data set for, so we generated it. Um, now, what I would say is that, you know, this is, it's one kind of split. I think we're, what we're trying to do here more is give people a conceptual way of thinking about how they might want to tackle difficult questions, make sure their findings are reliable, thinking about third data, you know, it does, this is not necessarily the be all end all, you know, I, we think it's a probably a good start, but there may be some people, depending on the questions they're trying to ask, may want to do their own, but we've provided some tools for, for to assist folks and in, in to do that as well. I mean, when Can I ask, okay, I was going to ask JB to what extent, I mean, it, while it's nice to use ABCD, do you, you don't have to use the ABCD data for these prior types of things, right? So you can get those from other literature, et cetera. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, one thing to say is that uh, power analysis are often used for uh, knowing how many participants you should require, like, you know, what's, what's the, what's the range of, uh, of that number that it sounds it would be reasonable for a specific question. Uh, in the case where the data are required and you, you know, uh, you just have to uh, then, you know, then there you, they're kind of a postdoc and could be useful to see, you know, hey, what's basically what's my effect size? What's, uh, is, is that reasonable in terms of the uh, confidence interval? And like, uh, and, and, and they they probably are like a good as as I think Damien said like they're probably a good measure of you know for future power analysis uh, like so you you have like a then a good estimation because you've got so many uh, participants in the in the in the cohort you got good estimation of of those effect size and uh, and and variability uh, and uh, and that it can be used for like a, a, you know some other studies the other thing is uh, if you are analyzing a very small part of the ABCD because you have like a constraints and uh, uh, then then it is very useful to to look at uh, what in the literature could look like uh, this this sort of effect that I'm, I'm trying to establish in a in a in a much much smaller court uh, and 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 that's really like that's hard because you know you, you don't you don't really know like I, I remember when a reviewer answer, to like uh, I think uh, uh, was a grant and uh, and uh, with Russ and we we said yeah, yeah, it'd be useful to look at those things uh, and the yeah, review answer uh, any any new experiment is entirely new and so, so therefore you know anything that you look in the literature uh, should be irrelevant and and of course it is not like you know like if you're looking at the same sort of a process or effect you you can give yourself uh, an idea of the of the effect size you can say hey my effect size should be wrong roughly on that sort of like a, a range and uh, and therefore this is the kind of power I, I'm, I'm kind of expecting uh, from that with that number of uh, participants so i think i think those fun, those things are just useful to sort of like a, uh, you know establish those bases but but if you have like a, a, a another cohort, or if you can split the data again, and, and you know that those are even more like a secure and powerful things, because because then yeah. Uh, but it's a question of like you know uh, um, how much data do you have, and therefore how much can you uh, look at some part of them to uh, part of the data to uh, to 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 start like, uh, to start your your to refine your your your, your questions uh, and. Uh, and your, and your processing. And then along the lines of uh, testing for significance, uh, what do you think about the idea of replacing our focus uh, to effect sizes rather than p-values as a countermeasure to p-hacking and other malpractices? It seems to me that you can hack effect sizes just as easily as p-values. Uh, can you? Yes, I guess, I guess you can. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, but still, it's uh, I think it, FX sizes are like a bring you back a little bit to reality. You can have a very very small p value and uh, and and something that is not really meaningful or significant in terms of the uh, of uh, of the impact on 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 the on the biological processes or the so 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 it gives you like you know if I if I find uh, a bold signal that has a, a, a sort of like you know. A, a, Increase of bolt signal in some condition by you know ten percent. I'm, I'm I'm going to think okay that's why, why is it so high? And if I found like a point one percent, I'm thinking okay uh, does does that really mean something? You know given what I know about the uh, uh, the viability of the bolt. Uh, uh, so 
So even though that might be significant because you have a very 10,000 subjects and like, you know, and, and, and you know, there's, there's a fallacy in the, obviously in the, uh, in the null hypothesis testing is that basically there's a, the null is always false. Uh, it's just a question of how many numbers do you have to, uh, so FXIs are definitely the way to go. You can't, I mean, there are several reports of, of like uh, making sure that you, we don't report only p-values. P-values themselves that uh, said sometimes they are evil. They're not evil. They're just, they're just evil if you just use them by themselves without uh, accompanying those numbers with FX sizes, number of subjects, uh, confidence interval, uh, possibly some uh, um, like a vision factors or things. So, so, so they they just have to be qualified, uh, you know, and that's that's the uh, that yeah that is the important thing. I would say I, I would just I I agree everything with what JB said. The one thing that I that I would definitely caution against is what is something that's boring our brain. It seems like since we've started training, is that small effect sizes are not meaningful. You know, um, I think that that mentality we have to kind of get past because the reality is a lot of what we what we see in in the brain related to these complex behaviors and things that we're really studying are actually small. That doesn't mean they're not meaningful. And I think that the genetics, in genetics, this is, you know, nobody would even argue that at all, that you, you know, there's a combination of a lot of these really small effects tells us a lot about, you know, um, you know, about, you know, the relationships with behavior and things like that. So I just, I think that it's right, particularly when you're dealing with sample size this big, that you, it's really, it's a really think, think deeply about the effect sizes more than the p-values, but just because you, and this is what you'll see, if, if you're doing everything right, the effect sizes probably should be small for most of the questions that we're trying to ask. Um, but it doesn't mean they're not meaningful. And there's, I, I'm gonna put in, a, I'm gonna put in the, in the chat or send it to the organizers here, some, some recent papers that have come out on this exact topic for people to read, I think will be helpful. I, I, I agree, Damien, I, I think uh, you're right. Like, a, a small effect size can be meaningful. I just want to caution people, say, hey, I'm finding that you know, like I said, you know, 0.1% augmentation of the both. I mean, uh, and I it might be completely meaningful in terms of like you know the uh, the, the processes, but but it is interesting to think about it compared to let's say hey you know uh, to to compare to a memory task or compared to what what is the what is the effect size of uh, of some some other processes in other regions and compare to that to just have like a a sense of the of the uh, of so somehow the you know how things are working and uh, and uh, and and they might be very very meaningful absolutely it just have to, a little bit of a question that you know again the null hypothesis is always false uh, there will be a difference between task uh, or between uh, if you had like an infinite number of subjects <laughs> there will you will always find a difference uh, so so the question really is at what point do we think that that increases or that difference. Uh, Makes sense, and I think it's it's entirely field dependent. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, there's no general answer to that question, but I think it 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 is useful for us if we are talking about fMRI to think, okay, what sort of like effect size people find in you know like with a, a movement effect, or what kind of effect size people find in a in a respiratory effects, or like a, and then and then relate those things, uh, you know, uh, to what we that is you know the, the question. I think that's that's good, just like a sensible sort of like, you know, approach, uh, if you want uh, to make sure that you have like a, in your mind, the, the appropriate range uh, that, you know, that, uh, that, that makes sense. Okay, um, so we have a question about registration and how that's done with kids. Um, so I don't know, Damon, can you speak a little bit to whether or not um, there's, what considerations have gone into um, uh, how that is done with the kids and whether or not that will change as they grow older. So basically the question so is- just, For just brain registration? Yeah, so the question is, is like, is there gonna be an age-related ABCD brain template like the MNI standard template for adults? Something along that. Yeah, um, not yet. Uh, right now we're just using, for the most part, has been using standard templates. Um, for the, the collection of 3165, that one is largely surface-based registration that's utilizing um, um, clear, you know, sulcal and gyral demarcations that deal to help to actually do a, the, the registration of the surface amongst a few other measures. Those things don't 
change much, particularly at this older age relative to adulthood. So the effects are likely, likely to be small. When you're dealing with volume, you know, the, you know, volume registrations, then it can may potentially have a, a, a slightly bigger effect, but even then it's likely going to be small. But with that said, we haven't done that yet, but I don't think it's out of the question that to get it really, really, really precise, that, that may be a run and, you know, a processing run in the future. Um, you know, the way that the, the releases are set up and, and just so everybody knows that 3.0 release has just came out the last couple of days. I just wanted to reiterate that. So look for it in your inboxes if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but the way that we've done these releases as there's new developments and new things kind of get better or you, something changes or you have a new set of age specific atlases that say, then they'll be part of the next, the next, the 4.0, the 5.0, the 6.0. So we haven't done that yet, but I wouldn't say never. Um, just as this is an FYI. All right. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. So I'll maybe just put one more question out there. Um, so in the slide on big data is hard. Um, it's mentioned that due to nested covariant structure, using permutation testing becomes less reliable. What are some alternative alternate suggestions? And if we uh, do need to proceed with permutation testing, what factors should be paramount? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, and the reason why the reason why this is is that as you you know, for the like everybody knows that some of these papers that come out that show that you know the way that we're doing significant testing, cluster detection, and things like that, right, are are sensitive to um, not being rigid enough in essence, and that the permutation testing is much better, and that that usually works. You can generate your own null distribution. The problem comes is that when you have lots and lots of within subject variables and lots of nested variables, and as they grow, then it becomes more, it becomes less, it becomes um, less reliable for being able to do because you have to keep all those in within subject variables together during the permutation. So um, one of the things that Tom Nichols and his students that came up with is using these mar using marginal models, which aren't aren't they're 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 different than the traditional mixed models in the, in, with regard to you know the fixed effects you know it's only fixed effects but it's like instead of just the random effects so you can't really look at individual differences like you can with the mixed models which we don't usually use that for those anyway but it allows you to do it's called bootstrapping it's similar to the permutation test but on the in essence on the residuals i'm using these sandwich estimator and things like this so um that is one alternative you know but i think that the for the permutation testing the main thing to think about when you're when we're doing that is um, is that, I mean, it, it works very well, obviously it's really good, but up to some points, the, the number of, of these kind of within subject and nested variables that you have to really have to worry about as you, it's like, as you, as you kind of get moving that where the, the P, you know, the, the, the precision becomes less reliable over time, over as you get more of those variables. All right. So I think, yep, yeah. I think we need to go ahead and, and make the transition now thank you so much to christina for moderating thank you very 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 much to damon for answering questions uh, we'll note that we do have quite a number of questions that we weren't able to answer we are going to go ahead and try to provide the answers to those um, offline once this meeting ends um, at this point we're going to transition to the second part of today's meeting to um, have a presentation from enda damon you're welcome to stay around with us and if, if you have other things to do we understand um, and uh, thank Thank you again for the time that you spent with us. Um, at, this point, <laughs> I, at this point, at this point, I'll go ahead and introduce Rebecca Rosen, who's here from ENDA, and I'll let her introduce um, herself and her team. Hi, thank you. Uh, so I am Rebecca Rosen. I'm the uh, NIMH program lead for the NIMH Data Archive, and David Obenshane is joining me. He's our uh, data services lead. Uh, Greg Farber could not be here today. Uh, so I have some slides to share. Um, one second. Let's see how this works. I should have tried that first. How's that? Looks good. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, so uh, I'm going to walk through just an overview of what we are. I know um, most of you on the workshop are pretty focused on NIMH Data Archive as the repository for the ABC data, ABCD data set. 
Uh, so I, I wanted to give you a more of a bird's eye view of what we are. Uh, I'll walk through um, the, the process of getting into our data sets and figuring out how to develop research cohorts for secondary analysis. And then I'm going to pass it over to uh, David, who's going to start uh, give you uh, an overview of, of the various tools that we have in place to actually get into the data. Some of them you're familiar with, others you may not be with. Uh, so at a high level, we're a cloud-based data commons. I, I think most of you know that we are uh, we are in the Amazon cloud. Uh, we have only human subjects data, and we're a federal data repository. We are a contract with NIMH. We house um, currently all of the human subjects data that is being generated from NIMH funded research, also NIAAA research, the Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse Institute. And we also have some other large data sets coming in uh, from other NIH institutes and centers. Uh, data are available through um, a not very difficult application process. Most of you have already done that. Uh, I hope you are, if you haven't already. Uh, and so they're made available to anyone in the research community. Uh, I think that's a, a big benefit that we have that you do not need to be a senior PI to request access to NDA data. Uh, we also have a lot of information about the data in our system available to unauthenticated users. So you can get a sense of what you want before you actually request access. And we do have web services for most of our, our, our um, services. We've been around for a long time. So we've been getting data in since 2008. We started out as the National Database for Autism Research. And we do have demographic, clinical imaging, and omics data, uh, and quite a few other kinds of data sets. It's, there really are no limits to how you can submit data sets. We just need, need metadata and a file path. Uh, we have half a million research participants in our database, and it's growing rapidly. Uh, we have uh, almost 4,000 authorized data users, and access expires after one year. Right now, we're at 3.2 petabytes. Uh, every day, this slide gets out of date as we get more imaging and genomics data. It's growing and growing, um, and that's great. Uh, we have uh, almost 1,500 collections. These are the containers that house data, usually associated with one NIH grant or a consortium. We also have over 200 studies, and these are uh, containers uh, that allow users to associate research results with the underlying data in NDA collections. We really expect to have more of these. I think this number is pretty low. I hope to see some NDA studies from you guys. Uh, data structures and data elements, this gets to how we harmonize our data. So we are one large Oracle database uh, and a lot of data uh, files stored in AWS S3 buckets. Those files are pointed to from uh, metadata rows in our database. Uh, that database is made up of 3,400 tables or structures. Each of those is either an instrument, like a data collection instrument, or a metadata manifest. And then within those, we've, uh, we call our variables data elements. We've got a lot of them. So we do our best to harmonize. Uh, but even with the harmonization approach we have, uh, we still have quite a um, large <coughs> number of variables. Uh, so there are a few ways you can search to see what we have. We have a, an Elasticsearch driven faceted search, kind of like a Google Google search of everything in our system. And um, there's a nice um, interface on the website to do so. Uh, this is also available programmatically. So we have a search API you can use to see what we have. And it's important to know that if you actually want to start using things, you have to go to this query tool. So this is where you start actually getting to data. So you can do a lot in this query tool without logging in, but once you've logged in, then you can actually start creating a, research, a cohort of subjects and collecting the data that we have on those subjects, packaging it up and accessing it for analysis. And there's a lot going on on this slide. So this is our query tool. And I, I wanted to show you, so we have these featured data sets. This is the one you're most um, familiar with. And this kind of teaches people who are not familiar with how our system works, how to get to data sets that are most frequently requested. But I do recommend going through and thinking about, you know, adding data to your cohorts. We've got lots of uh, imaging data sets uh, from other large scale studies that may be interesting as uh, additional components of your analysis cohort. Uh, you can filter out by demographics. You can filter out by age group, male, female, by race and ethnicity. Um, you can select specific studies. Say if you're interested in a clinical trial, you can just um, go to this uh, query facet. 
and, and the studies, these are where you'll probably find a fair number of the pipelines. You want to go and see uh, uh, the entire process and the underlying data that were used to generate those pipelines. You can go to papers. You can also search through our data dictionary if you only want to see subjects for which, for whom we have a specific um, data collection instrument. And then, of course, methods. Uh, you can look for, do you have data from diffusion MRI? I only want to pull down those kinds of data. So you can add those types of filters. And the way our system works, I, I will say, uh, be a little patient on this interface. Uh, it sits on top of a giant database. We are working on modernizing it. But right now, uh, you know, as you start looking through, sometimes you'll see a spinner. That's just the way it is. Um, it, it is going to be improving over time. Uh, but it's worth the wait. <laughs> and uh, once you've gone through and said, OK, I, I want to add that filter. So basically, you're starting out with our entire database, and you're constantly paring it down. And it, as you add the filters, the first step is actually a workspace. It's kind of a landing place, uh, a holding place, if you will, before you actually run the query on the database. It gives you a chance to look at the various filters that you think you want to add to your query. And then when you're ready, you say, okay, I do want, I want the uh, tabulated imaging data, but I only want the males. So, okay, um, then you, you click to submit to filter cart and then that's gonna take some time. So I think um, if you've not done this, you will find that there's gonna be uh, some spinning there. If you're adding a giant complicated query to the filter cart, uh, that is, it's gonna take some time, but when it does run through, it'll show you how many subjects fit your, uh, your criteria. You can actually run all these queries without being logged in. Uh, when you get to the final page, it'll tell you you don't have access to the data yet. So then you'll figure out how to get access. Uh, I'm jumping over to this packages. So um, once you've once you've uh, put all the data in your filter, if you are logged in and you do have access to the data in the filter cart, you can click on add data to uh, create data package. And you go to this page. This is where um, the data are, are packaged up. That's what we call it. And that, that includes all of the tabular data, any associated files that are linked to those tabular data, as well as any supporting documentation that, uh, that's associated with the collections from which those data uh, were sourced. And we also, so your package will show up here. Uh, we also have shared packages, and this is how we save people the time of going through the full query filter package process because we know that there are certain curated releases that users frequently want. And so that's where the uh, human connectome releases are packaged. And uh, that's also where the ABCD uh, curated releases will show up in these shared data packages. And at that point, you can start launching the tools that David will discuss in order to sort through search and uh, start downloading or analyzing the data in the package that you've uh, created. And so, David, I'm going to hand it over to you. I can keep driving the slides. OK. Yeah, so the this slide, we're, we're just talking about base, the basic steps <clears throat> for accessing, actually accessing the data. So we've gone through an overview of how to how to find the data, how to package the data. Um, and then the Im important thing for most people is, is actually getting a copy of the data to work with. Um, so the way NDA is set up, um, there's a, a web service on the back end um, that handles providing uh, a copy of, it provides a, a list or a manifest of all of the files that are contained in your package. And uh, Rebecca mentioned earlier, um, we write out tabular files. So um, that are the metadata and have the references to associated files. Those tabular files are also their objects in S3 object storage and the associated files, the, the uh, neuroimaging scans, um, genomic sequencing data, those are also objects in S3. So all of the data that you access from NDA comes from S3 object store. Um, so we have a web service that provides uh, a, a list of the um, S3 URLs for all of the data that are contained in your package. And so um, the data manager service provides that. Um, you can get that information um, through tools, which we'll get to in the next slide, or you can also, uh, there's an option when you create your data package from that data packages page that Rebecca showed, uh, there's an option to go ahead and push your package to what we call a mini NDAR or MINDAR. Um, and essentially all of the data that you would download as um, tab delimited files instead gets put into an Oracle relational database. 
um, you're giving connection information, you can connect to that and you can actually write SQL queries against the metadata, um, which can be useful if you're um, trying to compare data. Um, it, it's a little bit easier for some to work with. Uh, that's another way to get the metadata um, that doesn't require downloading objects from, from S3. Ultimately, if you wanna access the, the binary data, um, the neuroimaging scans or genomic sequencing or, or what have you, um, you're going to need to, to pull data down from S3. Um, and the way you do that is through uh, um, AWS Federation user token. So that's a temporary token, it lasts 36 hours. Um, it gives you access to the data that are in your package. Uh, and that token is used by tools, which we'll get to on the next page um, for accessing the data. Um, you can create a token uh, for those tools uh, by requesting one from the data manager service. Um, and we have some examples on, on our GitHub page for how to do that. Uh, you can also generate a um, temporary credential using our uh, download manager Java Web Start application or command line tool. Um, in terms of actually downloading the data from S3, because of what we're providing um, our AWS credentials, uh, you'll need to make a signed request to AWS with those credentials to access the data. Um, that's most easily done by using a tool. So AWS provides software development kits and uh, pretty much any language that you would like uh, to write software in. Um, they also provide a command line tool, uh, which you can put those credentials into in order to access the data. And there's a um, data access page on the NDA site that goes into detail about how to do this. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Rebecca. So, so most folks are, are going to want to use some automated form for doing this, not have to sort of tie all the pieces together and figure out how to do it themselves. Um, so we have on our GitHub page, there's a, a Jupyter notebook called Data Access Notebook that has some examples of how to interact with the web services, including how to generate um, uh, AWS token, Federation user token, and how to use that token to pull data uh, down from an S3 object. It has some e examples for how to connect to a MINDAR, write a SQL query against a MINDAR, pull back, um, uh, URLs or S3 objects and download those. Um, I will caution that that data access notebook was done in, I think 2015 maybe, and possibly updated somewhat after that. It probably needs to be um, updated again, um, but most of what's in there should work uh, just out of the box. I think the search pieces are the biggest pieces that have changed. Um, there's also a Python package. So I would say that if you start working with it and you run it into issues, you can send the help desk uh, a request. To, um, let us know, and we can make that update as well. Yep. Um, and there's there's a on GitHub you can you can, there's an issues place too that you can put issues in uh, for. And some, sometimes sometimes helpful people will respond to those issues that aren't on the NDA help desk, uh, which yeah, yeah that the, the community has been helpful on on the GitHub page in some cases and answering questions. Um, the NDA tools is a, it's a Python package. It's available from the Python package index. Um, it's, so it's a, it's a library of um, uh, Python classes that you can use to create your own tools. And we also provide with that some command line tools. So we provide a command line tool for doing data uploads to NDA. Um, there's a workflow with a command line tool to validate your data and then a workflow with a command line tool to, to actually upload those data. Uh, we also have a corresponding download command command line tool. So that allows for you to take a package, you know, specify a package that you want to download data from or specify a list of S3 URLs, for example. And it does the work, um, you have to input your credentials, but it does the work of fetching those tokens and downloading those data for you. Um, and it has the benefit of being command line. So you can wrap that into some other workflow that you have. Um, I saw uh, at least one question in the Q&A from earlier related to um, the work that uh, Damien Fair's group with uh, DCAN Labs have done with the bidsified version of the ABCD data. Um, so I did want to give a shout out to that. There's a GitHub repository there. Um, their, their method, you create a package from that collection um, but it, follow, it uses the same workflow, the same steps that we um, discussed earlier, that that tool will fetch tokens using your credentials, your um, NDA credentials, 
and then pull data down from those S3 URLs, which are provided as part of the package that you download. Um, and then we also have our download manager tool, uh, which is uh, fairly old at this point, it runs from Java Web Start technology. Um, we're expecting to have a new version of the download manager before the end of the year that users will be able to work with. Um, but this tool still works and will continue to work. Um, it, it does not allow for you to see the contents of your package. It's just you start, you download the whole package or you don't download the whole package. Um, those are the options really uh, with the download manager tool. In terms of new tools, um, there's been some work done with Datalad uh, to um, create a, a uh, data lad repository or git annex for data files in NDA. Um, and that I think believe that's in the um, in the main branch of data lad at this point. I think I checked that out yesterday and it looked like it was there. Um, that that is a work in progress. So I don't think that's ready for prime time yet, but we're in discussions with um, Yarek from data lab about getting that uh, getting that working. Um, we have the new download manager tool that I just mentioned, which will be going out for beta before the end of the year. Um, that allows for you to actually access shared packages directly from the tool without having to go to the NTA site to see shared packages. It also allows for you to see the contents of the package and it will represent the package as a directory file, file um, directory tree. So you can look within specific folders identify specific fa files, you can filter by file type, you can search by file name or directory path. Um, so it becomes a pretty useful tool if you're working with data that's organized in a standardized format, for example, bids, um, you, can, you can put filter criteria in and identify some sort of subset of the data that you're particularly interested in and then choose to download those, um, those items from the package. So we see this as a way to not have the entire package or none of the package, um, but a way for, for you to sort of interact and, and maybe do some exploratory data analysis on your package before downloading the whole thing. Um, and supporting that new download manager tool is a new package web service. Um, and it, it's different from the data manager service in that there are more endpoints and more sort of granular operations that you can do through that web service. Um, it also, in addition to providing credentials, temporary AWS credentials. It also provides pre-signed URLs. Um, the benefit there is that you can use any HTTP tool to download the, the data files through that pre-signed URL. Pre-signed just means that temporary credentials have been generated and those temporary credentials have been used to sign a request to AWS um, that allow for you to access a, a particular object. So it operates at the object level, but that allows for you to use things like your browser or curl or any other you know, Python package that requests package, for example, um, with the pre-signed URL and not have to deal with um, AWS software development kit, for example, um, to access those data. So that we see that as a, a way to make the data more accessible um, without being necessarily tied to uh, AWS specific tools. It's much, much easier to, uh, to access those data. Um, and when users are, um, Right, so if, if you do some data analysis in, in NDA, um, we anticipate and expect that you'll um, publish the results of your data analysis through an NDA study. Um, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, that's a container, a logical container that can have any data from any collections that you have access to in NDA. Um, so it can be cross studies, cross project or specific to a, an individual project. Um, but it allows for you to create a snapshot essentially of the data that are in NDA. Um, it issues a digital object identifier for that. Um, and if it is associated with a, a publication, that digital object identifier will be associated with the digital object identifier for that publication as well. Uh, so we do some um, linking between digital object identifiers there. Um, and that will be a persistent object in, in NDA um, when you go back to that follow that DOI, it will take you to the same landing page. Um, even if data are archived, for example, from that study, they'll still be accessible um, to if you access it through that through that study object. Um, we have some example uh, code repositories on GitHub that, that have pipelines. I think the, the most complete example that I can think of is from DCAN Labs. So they have um, code there for accessing the ABCD data from the ABCD collection, pulling down the DICOM files, converting the DICOM files into bids format, um, 
uh, nifty with uh, in, in the bids format data structure. They have examples for uploading those data for NDA, and then they have their own NDA ABCD downloader for the bidsified version of the, of the ABCD data. Um, so if you're looking for some examples for workflows that have been um, created, that sort of works with all the different aspects that NDA provides. Um, there are some earlier work that was done by the Child Mind Institute and uh, Nitric to do some quality analysis of neuroimaging data stored, stored in NDA. Um, and so those are also available from our GitHub uh, repository. If you go look there, you'll see um, links to those GitHub repositories. Um, that's it, I don't have anything more on that slide. Did you want me to speak to this, Rebecca, as well? Um, I, I can take it, sure. And, and also thank you, David, uh, and sure. hopefully, this is the last slide. So I did want to say, um, you know, David talked a lot about ways to get to the data. Uh, we strongly discourage local downloads for lots of reasons I think everyone can imagine. Uh, and so we are, uh, we do have a limit. The limit is actually quite high. Uh, it depends who you are. Uh, for you guys, maybe it may not be so high. Um, so over 30 days, you cannot download more than 20 terabytes of data. Uh, locally. So uh, there is no limit to moving data into other uh, accounts in AWS, into other storage locations. We can track that and we will only cut you off if uh, you're downloading locally over 20 terabytes. Uh, we do have a, a computational credits program available. We're doing this as we're trying to encourage users to move to the cloud for their analysis and co-analyses. So uh, collaboration in the cloud is key. Um, and so this, our, our program, I think many of you are familiar with it and have already submitted and have been approved for access to a computational credit account. We'll give you what you need in our cloud environment. So it'll be a machine and storage, any permutation of that um, within our firewall. And, um, and we'll give you a certain level of control. You'll have a security training and such. Uh, the, the basic restriction is you have to have access to one of our permission groups access to our data. So it's it's pretty straightforward. And the request you can submit from our website, uh, it tell us what you're going to do with it, how it's going to advance research, et cetera. And uh, we have a cap right now at 5,000 per group per computational credit account. And we'll work with you to set it up and uh, figure out how to hand it off. And, um, and that's it. So, um, you know, we, We've got a lot here. Uh, we also, one thing I didn't put on here is our help desk. Uh, the, our help desk is you know, quick turnaround response to any question or routing to uh, uh, experts on the team who can better answer your, your questions. So I always put that out there as a resource. If you're working with our data, our help desk is your resource. And I think we do have a few minutes for questions um, before the end of the class. Thanks very, very much, Rebecca and Deva. We appreciate you making time for us today. Um, we had a couple of questions that popped up in the Q&A that um, both David and Satra addressed. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and read these out loud because I think these are both important questions. And, and meanwhile, we do have a few minutes left. So if a student or two wants to pop in another question in there, I think we might have time for it. But one is about um, IRB approval. Um, Institutions vary in terms of what policies they require for these ducks to get institutional signature. And so some institutions require that there be an IRB of record that relates to analyses of ABCD data before they sign off on the ducks, before those get sent to ENDA for execution. Um, and other institutions, I mean, it's some do, some don't. And this is an institutional thing. So for students who are encountering this at their institution, know that it can be common, um, but it's not fully required. And, and we need you to adopt the policies and comply with the policies of your home institution so that you can get those ducks executed. Um, the other one was related to, I'm wondering whether I need to get additional data approval for the ASD group if I wanna look at the relation between the data in ABC and autism. And David indicated that those data are accessed in the permissions group. Um, I'm wondering if the student is actually asking whether or not that needs a second duck or if that could all be flowed into one duck. Right, yeah, and we do, our, our, our policy is, uh, one data access request per permission group. And so uh, the ABCD and Connectome data are in one permission group. 
and uh, the bulk of our data, our other data, including our autism data uh, that are broadly consented for research use. Those are all in uh, what we call the NIMH data archive permission group. So it is a separate data access request. Uh, you know, the process, I, the upstream process, as you mentioned, uh, there's there's additional effort uh, depending on your institution. But once the, the uh, data access request is submitted to us, it's a 10 day turnaround for an NIH data access committee to review it. So it's not too much extra time. Uh, but I do, that. that's one of the reasons I put up uh, all, all that information about the other data that we have, because I do think, and I hope that uh, the students in this workshop do submit data access requests. Um, and you know, as you're working on the ABCD data here, uh, start thinking about creating ex expanded cohorts. Uh, you have some time to get the new ducks through. So as you mentioned, you 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 encourage, and I, again, I even think the data use agreement requires that as we create, you know, derived products, you know, to make those available back through the NDA, through the studies types of things. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that process and what kinds of things? Okay, I've done something, you know, and I want to bring it back. What kinds of steps I go through to to do that? Sure. So um, it, the study creation process, we have a nice tutorial on, on our website, um, but there is, um, there's, kind of, there's a create study button. Uh, and then basically you start, I th the best way to start creating a study is by actually running a query. And David may correct me, <laughs> but you, you, you run a query, um, uh, all the subjects that are in the cohort that you are analyzing in your publication result pipeline, whichever. And then instead of adding it to the package, you add it to the study. And so what that does, just to be clear, it's not duplicating any of that data. As David said, it's a logical container. It has pointers to each row of data and each, so that's the subject, the date when data were collected and the variables that were collected or the pointer to the, uh, the um, imaging file or genomics file or what have you. And so that you, you, you initially create the study by you know, creating the data set and, and copying it to the study, but it's not actually copied. It's just pointing to the underlying data in the collections. And then you can start adding more information. So we have hierarchical, hierarchical structured um, metadata that you can fill out essentially trees of information about the data analysis that you did. If you don't see something that you think should be in that tree, you can submit a request and add it. And then you can add links to, you add the PMID if it's a, a PubMed publication, you add, uh, you can add URLs and you could add um, analytical data sets as attachments. Uh, those are controlled access as well. So users can only access the study, the attachments and the underlying data if they are authorized to access all of the underlying data that you've used in your analysis. But I it is important that, you, and you can upload files of any size to that. Uh, so there's, there, there, I believe there aren't any limits to the files that you can upload to uh, the web interface. And then users can then package the entire study and they'll get the underlying data from the collections, as well as all the metadata that you've entered into there, as well as all the um, file attachments that you've put on the study. And then um, you get the DOI when you share the study. So it's important that you can, you can create the study and you can be sending out your manuscript for review. And as, as soon as you get the, um, just a few more changes and then we'll publish then uh, you go ahead and you share it and you get the DOI and that's when you add it to the final manuscript. I think, um, I think there's one, one, I think, I think with this, we did an update to the um, study module that actually when you create the, when you create the study, it reserves a DOI for you yeah. so that you don't, um, you can provide the DOI uh, while your manuscript is in, in process. And then when you share the study that, that the DOI isn't actually real, it's not registered with data site, um, but it's reserved, it's, per, it's persistent already. And when you share the study, then um, the NDA system will will push that DOI through and register with data site. Um, so you have the ability to provide the, ideally you provide the DOI when you submit the manuscript. Um, so, yeah, I hate so, to be abrupt, but I know we do lose yeah. our, uh, we turn into pumpkins at the official time. Yeah. So, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and again, thank we know how guys. to find you, our students know how to Absolutely. find you so we'll continue the dialogue and thank you for right. being there thank have you. a good day best of luck bye thank everybody you, everybody